Tonight's presentation is titled, On a Short Lease, Maintenance Costs. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications and uh, certified flight instructor certificate holder, AMP mechanic certificate holder, IA privileges, aviation maintenance technician of the year in 2008. And of course, a member of EAA, Mike, we sure do thank you for volunteering your time to do this monthly first Wednesday of the month webinar that you do. I know you've been doing it uh, almost as long as we've been doing it here. Uh, I think you go back way to 2010 also. So we sure do appreciate you and all that you've contributed over all these years and sure do look forward to many, many more uh, upcoming here in the future. Um, with that, I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Well, great, Tim. Um, and Good evening, everybody. Uh, Tim is coming to you from EAA headquarters, and I am coming to you from the 58th floor of the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada this evening on a kind of a portable lash up, so I hope everybody is hearing me okay. I'm not in my usual studio at home. Um, but at any rate, uh, as uh, uh, Tim said the tonight's presentation is uh, is called on a short leash and it will be quickly apparent <laughs> the reason for the title um, you know I'm I'm frequently asked by my clients and by other aircraft owners to recommend good maintenance shops in a particular geographic area and my company maintains a, a large database of maintenance resources uh, last count I think I saw that there were 15 or 1600 shops uh, in our in our database um, all over the United States and and uh, in, in various other countries around the world um, we even uh, have our database hooked to a private Google map that we use um, where the, the shops are depicted on the on the map and they, they're depicted with color-coded icons um, that are based on our uh, prior experience with the shops. So the, the shops that we've had really good outcomes from uh, tend to have green icons and the ones that we have had not very good outcomes have red icons and ones in the middle have yellow icons and there are some ones with white icons that, that we haven't had enough experience to, to rate yet. Uh, th we don't publish any of this stuff. Uh, we don't want to alienate anyone, but uh, but if a client says, you know, where can I find a, a good maintenance shop uh, near Indianapolis? Uh, we can type Indianapolis into the search box and up pops a, a hundred nautical mile circle around Indianapolis with all these shops that we've got in our database and. Uh, with the color codes based on our experience with the shop. Um, and we do our best to steer aircraft owners to the shops that we had the best outcomes with. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this for 14 years, so we've got a fair amount of experience. Um, and probably more importantly, we try to steer them away from the shops that have we've not had very good outcomes with. And, you know, in, in providing um, uh, referrals to to our clients and other aircraft owners, I, I often find myself telling them something along the lines of, you know, this is an outstanding shop that does very thorough inspections and excellent work, but be prepared for a big bill unless you keep them on a short leash, which is the reason for the title of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this webinar. And uh, so we're going to talk about what keeping them on a short leaf, leash means. And you know, when I say something like this, um, it's I don't mean it as a criticism of the shop. It simply reflects the fact that the, the shop, um, that the, the, the you know the best shops are the ones that tend to do very thorough inspections and and um, do uncompromisingly meticulous repairs. And, and have generally a perfectionist attitude towards doing maintenance. And these are, you know, precisely the attributes that we 
would like to see in a shop. Um, but shops like that, that, that are very, very thorough and have a very perfectionist attitude towards doing maintenance, um, are ones that also can result in stereo, uh, serious sticker shock unless the owner uh, actively throttles the shop back by explicitly directing them to perform only the work um, that the owner wants performed and nothing more. If you leave the shop to its own devices, <laughs> uh, shops like that will will be inclined, you know, to do a show plane restoration, and you wind up with a with a very large uh, bill. So, you know, the better the shop, the more important it is in our experience to to uh, uh, to actively give them direction as to exactly what we want done and what we don't want done. And to illustrate this, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a particular annual inspection on a particular aircraft because I think it's very illustrative of the point that I'm trying to make. This uh, particular aircraft was a 2006 Cirrus SR-22 um, and was going through a, its 2021 annual, which means that the um, airplane was 15 years old at the time that this annual was done. Uh, keep that in mind because it will its its uh, significance will shortly become apparent the inspection was being done at a Cirrus authorized service center uh, one that we'd worked with uh, before and, and like quite a lot and per our normal uh, practice and the practice that i have recommended many times in this webinar series um, we instructed the shop to perform the annual inspection, but to do no repairs and to order no parts until it had written up its detailed uh, inspection findings in, as in, in the form of a detailed discrepancy list with um, recommended repairs for each discrepancy that was found and uh, detailed cost estimates uh, for each of those each of those repair recommendations and to provide all of this information um, to us uh, so that we could review it with the aircraft owner and um, decide what work uh, the aircraft owner wanted the shop to do in terms of, of doing repairs. So in this case, the shop completed its, its inspection of this uh, 2006 Cirrus SR-22 and uh, provided us with a discrepancy list with 34 um, discrepancies on it um, and provided you know recommended corrective action for each discrepancy and gave us estimated uh, cost of both labor and parts uh, for each of the recommended repairs and the discrepancy list looked like this um, and uh, the, the repair estimates for these 34 discrepancies um, total to uh, about $22,500. Um, and that was on top of the, ins the cost of the inspection itself, which was flat rated at $2,500, which is about typical for an SR-22 normally aspirated. Um, so uh, he here's, here's a little more, more detail about what that discrepancy list uh, that the shop gave us looked like. And notice that the it has column headings that number the items and for each one to describe the discrepancy that was found, the recommended repair, the estimated labor cost for the repair and the estimated parts cost for the repair. And when it all added up, it, it came to almost $16,000 in labor and $6,600 in parts. Uh, so it, it, it uh, added up to a total of uh, close to $22,000, about 22,000 bucks, I guess 22,500, I guess, um, all totaled um, to do all of the repairs of all the discrepancies that were found on the inspection. So had the owner not intervened actively and just let the shop do what it was proposing to do, which is really in my experience what most owners do, um, the shop would have uh, completed the work and presented the owner with an invoice for about $25,000.
Um, but needless to say, that's not what happened. Um, we we took this uh, discrepancy list and cost estimate and went through it line by line uh, with the uh, with the owner um, and offered some suggestions about w which items um, we really thought ought to be repaired and which ones it would be prudent to decline or defer. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the, how we make those decisions as to what we recommend uh, approving and what we recommend declining. But in, in general terms, we normally, you know, in, encourage the owner to approve those items that are either clearly necessary items to repair in terms of keeping the airplane safe or reliable, and, and those that are relatively inexpensive to do. Um, and we generally recommend that they decline things that are not demonstrably necessary, particularly if they're expensive items. Um, so to get a little bit more into detail, um, the shop wrote up a large number of items that were quite costly. I'll go through them with you. Um, and they wrote them up not because there was any actual discrepancy found, but rather because they were items that were due according to the maintenance manual. Now, the word due <laughs> is one of the most expensive words uh, in, in the world of aircraft maintenance. And for us, the word due is a big, big red flag. Um, for Part 91 operators, non-commercial operators, which uh, most of our clients are, probably most of you are, um, just because a manufacturer says something is due at a particular calendar time or a particular number of hours doesn't mean that we have to do it. Um, under FAA regulations, Part 91 operators are never required to perform maintenance just because the manufacturer says it's due. Uh, the only time that we're required to uh, perform such do items is if the FAA says it's it, it, it has to be done. And, and the FAA would say it had to be done in, in either by issuing an airworthiness directive or for um, a part 23 airplanes like the Cirrus um, for uh, approving an airworth, airworthiness limitation. Uh, legacy airplanes like the Cessna 310 I fly don't have any airworthiness limitations, but newer ones like the Cirrus do. So, for example, there's an airworthiness limitation that says the, the parachute system has to be repacked um, every 10 years. And because that's an airworthiness limitation, it's not coming from the manufacturer, it's coming from the FAA. And if the FAA says something has to be done, we have to do it. It's not negotiable. Same thing is true of airworthiness directives. Airworthiness directives have to be complied with. Um, but if it's just the manufacturer that's saying it's due, then, then we, we don't have to do it unless if we don't want to. Um, so there were a lot of items like that. Um, and in almost every case, our recommendation is to not do items, not do work when the manufacturer says it's due. But to, to do that work only strictly on condition, meaning when uh, inspection of the airplane indicates that, that something needs to be done, not just because the maintenance manual says it ought to be done. Um, so, you know, if, if something is working fine and the, ma and the maintenance manual says it's due for overhaul or replacement, um, we generally say, uh, no thanks. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, our emphasis tends to be on doing things based on actual inspection and, and actual determination that, that, that something needs to be done, not just because something is written in the maintenance manual saying that it should be done. And fortunately, under FAA rules, we don't, we don't have to do things uh, just because the manufacturer recommends doing them at a certain time. Um, so, for example, the the Cirrus uh, 
service center cited that the propeller and governor were due for overhaul because it had been over five years since the last overhaul. And overhauling the propeller and the governor would have cost about $4,000. Um, there were addition, a whole bunch of additional items that, that the maintenance manual recommended doing uh, every five years. And that's that's why the fact that this airplane was 15 years old is significant because a whole bunch of five-year items came up in 2021. Um, and doing all of those other five-year items would have added another $4,300 to, to the bill. So between the prop and the prop governor and these other five-year items, we're, we're now talking about roughly $8,300 in, in cost. There were a bunch of other do items that weren't five-year items specifically, but for example, uh, the manufacturer recommended replacing the number two battery every two years. We, we don't believe in replacing batteries every two years. We, we, we believe in doing a capacity check on the battery and replacing the battery when its uh, capacity is inadequate. The normal rule is that if the battery's capacity is, is below 80% of what it was when it was new, it's time to replace it. But that's doing it on condition rather than on a fixed timetable. Um, manufacturer recommends um, cleaning fuel nozzles every 300 hours. We believe in cleaning fuel nozzles only when engine monitor data indicates that there's a dirty nozzle. What, why do it on a fixed timetable when, you know, Cirruses are instrumented up the gazoo and we have all of this uh, data that it's, kind of, it's recording once every second that it's flying, and we can look at the data and tell if there's a dirty fuel nozzle. Uh, similarly, the, they recommend an annual um, uh, adjustment of the fuel injection system. Um, we say let's look at the let's look at the engine monitor data, and if the if, if the fuel flow on takeoff is what it ought to be, and if the idle performance is what it ought to be, then leave it alone. Um, recommend a two-year magnetometer calibration. Well, you know, the owner can go out to a compass rose and check the magnetometer and have it recalibrated only if, it, if, if it's drifted off, which it hardly ever does. Um, so at our recommendation, um, the owner declined uh, all of those do items, which knocked, you know, ten or twelve thousand dollars off the off the bill. Then interestingly enough, and this was seemed a little bit peculiar, but the shop wrote up discrepancies on a bunch of items that the owner said were working just fine. For example, the shop claimed that the nose steering was stiff. Uh, Sarah's has a free castering nose wheel and it's got some Belleville washers that control the, the stiffness of, of the thing turning um, in order to uh, uh, prevent it from shimmying. Um, the shop claimed that, the, the, that it was too stiff, but the owner said that, that the plane had no issues uh, steering at all. Um, the shop claimed that, it, that the voltage was fluctuating on the main and essential buses, but when we pulled up the engine monitor data and looked at it, um, the, uh, the, the bus voltages were rock solid. Again, that's stuff that's recorded by the engine uh, monitor, so we can take a look at it anytime we want to, and we can look at it over, over history of many flights, and it, it was rock solid. So why the shop wrote that up, we have no idea, but when we looked at the engine monitor data, there was no problem with the voltage regulation. The shop also said uh, the flight director uh, command bars did, were not responding properly to pitch movements, but the owner swore that the uh, flight director and autopilot had been working like a charm for him. So again, um, the owner declined uh, all of those items, things that the shop wrote up, but the owner said were, were working fine. Um, then there were actually several legitimate discrepancies that, uh, although they were discrepancies, didn't rise to the level of airworthiness concerns and that the owner chose to defer. Um, the, the, um, uh, for example, the, the shop 
uh, wrote up uh, that the the nose wheel fairing, it's a fiberglass uh, speed fairing, uh, was cracked and proposed to do a repair on it. But the owner said it had been cracked for the last three years. The crack had been stop drilled. He'd been monitoring it. The crack wasn't growing, and so that you know he was he didn't didn't feel it needed repair. And we tended to agree with him. Um, similarly, the shop wrote up a number of corrosion related discrepancies. Now that's you know the Cirrus is a is a plastic airplane. <laughs> But there are some things on the on the Cirrus that that are vulnerable to corrosion. They're made of metal, for example, flap hinges and some of the control surfaces. Um, and the shop wrote up some some corrosion related discrepancies. Um, but the corrosion wasn't um, ha hadn't reached the level of being an error than its concern. And the owner was was on a waiting list to get his airplane in the hangar. He he had been uh, stored out on a tie down, um, and he was getting close to the top of the waiting list to get the airplane into a hangar. And he decided that um, he was going to wait on correcting these uh, uh, corrosion related, mild corrosion related issues until he could get the, the airplane into a hangar so that uh, uh, once the corrosion was corrected, it, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't start developing again. And, the, you know, those seemed to be reasonable judgment calls on on, on his part, and so we, we we were supportive of of, of that. So at any rate, at the end of the day, the owner, um, with, with a little coaching from us, decided to approve eleven of the recommended repairs, and to uh, decline or to defer um, uh, twenty three others, uh, either because they weren't needed or because he decided that. That he wanted to wait a little longer. For example, the the, the corrosion issues, he wanted to wait until he got the airplane in hangar. And the estimated cost of those eleven items that the uh, owner chose to approve came to about two thousand dollars, while the estimated cost of the twenty-three items that the owner um, decided to decline or defer. Um, was uh, something north of twenty thousand dollars, and so the final result was that we gave the shop back a uh, basically a, a slightly altered version of their discrepancy list, with a couple of new columns added to the to the right side with the owner's response to the uh, to to the shop's discrepancy list, and the responses look you know something like this where indicated which items were approved, which were declined, and for the ones that were declined, it explained the reason that the owner uh, had decided to, to decline those items. And so this is exactly what I mean when we're talking about keeping a shop on a short leash. Uh, shop did a very, very thorough inspection, um, which we like, and the owner did a, a very good job of sorting through that discrepancy list and deciding which items he thought were were, were worth uh, repairing and which items um, he decided to uh, to decline or defer. Now, some people looking at this might say that you know the shop was overzealous, overpriced, trying to take advantage of the owner. Um, uh, some of the shops like this tend to get a reputation among owners of being high-priced shops. But I would strongly disagree. These are the kinds of shops we like to work with. Um, they're thorough. They do meticulous repairs. They have all of the characteristics that we want to see in a shop. Um, also, this was a Cirrus Authorized Service Center. And so you have to consider the fact that as a Cirrus Authorized Service Center, the shop was basically obligated to write up all of the items that were due according to the maintenance manual because the shop is, you know, if, if they weren't doing that, Cirrus would, would could probably take away their, their, uh, their service center approval. Um, and the shop was basically obligated to perform all of the manufacturer recommended repairs unless the owner explicitly instructed them not to do so. Um, 
and that you know this is typical of uh, service centers that are that that have a manufacturer's approval. They're expected to play by the manufacturer's rules unless the owner tells them to do otherwise. So it's pretty important for the owner to tell them to do otherwise when when that's appropriate. Um, to its credit, the shop um, did not complain when we went back to them with this list that said do 11 of the items and don't do 23 of them. They were happy to 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 accept that direction and do exactly what the owner. Uh, asked them to do and not anymore. Um, so, and, and the result was that the owner got a vastly lower invoice at the end of the process. Um, and there weren't any surprises. It was exactly what the owner expected because everything had been written up beforehand as in terms of what it was going to cost. And this is exactly the way things are supposed to work. So you may be asking, is, is this a typical case? Uh, is, is this the sort of thing that is, is normal in, in, in annual inspections? And I would say uh, yes and no. Um, certainly when dealing with with shops whose annual inspections are as thorough as, as this one was, it's quite common for half to two thirds of the listed discrepancies uh, to be um, declined or deferred at the owner's option. Um, it, it, that's, that's quite commonplace in my experience. Um, on the other hand, um, it's pretty unusual for the declined items to represent 90% of the total estimated cost. And that happened in this case primarily because the airplane was 15 years old and there were a whole bunch of five-year, expensive five-year items that all came due at the same time. So th that's why there was this very, very dramatic reduction in the, in the invoice. Uh, that much reduction is, is, is not terribly common. Um, but there was a good reason for it in this case. But saying no to half or two thirds of the items on the discrepancy list is is very common. It's, it's probably should be routine with the shops that are as thorough in their inspections as uh, as this one was. Um, so it's it's the point I'm trying to get across is is that it, it's the shop's job to do a really thorough inspection and find everything that they possibly can wrong with the airplane. And then it's, and, and to write it up in, in detail. And then it's the owner's job to go over that list and decide which items uh, to authorize the shop to perform and which ones to say no to. Um, and so it's it's really a, a team effort. And uh, we do want our shops to be very, very thorough. Um, but we also want our maintenance costs to be within reason. And the only way those two things can happen is if the owner is actively involved in the process. You know, to keep the shop from getting upset with you, it's, it's important not to say no to things that would cause the shop to have to sign off the annual as unairworthy. So we don't, we don't, we try not to say no to things that uh, our, uh, our legitimate airworthiness, airworthiness issues. Um, we try not to say no to things that are required by regulations, like complying with ADs or airworthiness limitations, because those are those are non-negotiable. We have to say yes to those. Um, but there are a lot of things that that we can say no to. Uh, a lot of things that are prudent to say no to, and that's really. The responsibility of the aircraft owner, and when owners sign up for our managed maintenance program, we we kind of help them make those decisions. But but every owner should be making those decisions, whether they're clients of ours or not. Um, that that's that's really the the owner's uh, role in this process. So Tim, that's uh, all the prepared material I have, but I would be very happy to open things up for some Q and A. 
All right, Mike, thank you very much. We do have a few questions that have come in up to this point. So let's jump in. Um, first, Williams, a very general, what are some good general examples of some items that can be deferred, i.e. not airworthiness items? Um, well, I'm, I mean, we we just went through a whole lot of examples of, of, of things that can be prudently deferred, but you know, as the, the 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 very first category that I mentioned, which comes up constantly on, you know, on annuals, is this question of items that are due according to the maintenance manual, because every maintenance manual has uh, this long list of things that should be done, you know, every hundred hours, every twelve calendar months, every five years, or you know whatever um, and philosophically we're generally opposed to doing things on a fixed timetable there, there are a few things that 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 we agree need to be on a done on a fixed timetable because there's no good way to do them on condition for example uh, we, we do believe that you know, magneto should should be sent out for 500 hour uh, IRANs uh, every five, you know, every 500 hours because a magneto is basically a black box. We we don't have any way of determining its condition without opening it up. Uh, unfortunately, um, engines aren't like that. Engines, there are lots of ways we can stick bore scopes in them. We can check the oil filter for metal. We can send out oil samples to the lab. There's just tons of ways that we can determine engine condition. We have we have engine monitor data that, that, that tells us exactly what's happening during the combustion events and so on. But there, there are a few things like magnetos that, that, uh, that are basically black boxes where we can't really tell what their condition are without tearing them apart. But those are the exception rather than the rule. Um, and so generally for, for the vast majority of things on airplanes, we don't believe in, in doing things on a fixed timetable. We don't believe in you know, overhauling props every five years. Um, you know, the, the, if the if the the prop is is governing RPM properly and not leaking and doesn't have any obvious corrosion issues or or, or big giant nicks on the blades, um, then then you know we suggest leaving it alone, regardless of what the maintenance manual says. Um, and most things are like that. You know, if somebody told you that you should replace your tires every 500 landings. I mean, I don't think anybody would do that. You know, we you look at the tire and, it, you know, based on what you see, you decide whether the tire's worn out and needs replacement or not. But nobody replaces tires on a fixed timetable. Maybe the airlines do, I don't know, but uh, nobody does that in general aviation. We always replace tires on condition. And we, we believe that almost, all the components on aircraft are, are more like tires than, than, than magnetos that, that they, they, in general, should, should be dealt with on condition rather than on a fixed timetable. So that's a big category of things that we you know, would recommend uh, saying no to, is things that are written up simply because the manual says that they're due. Um, then the second broad category I mentioned were, were things that the shop writes up that the owner knows is working are, are working fine. Or things like the, you know, that crack wheel fairing where the owner's perfectly aware that the, that the wheel fairing has a crack, but, it, but it's had that crack for the last three years and the crack's not growing and it's not an airworthiness issue, so leave it alone. So they're just, they're just tons of things that, that, that you can prudently say no to. Mike, I know that a lot of your focus here is on uh, standard category aircraft that have a type certificate. We have one question from David wondering how applicable are these deferrals in the special light sport aircraft area where the FAA accepts what the ASTM and manufacturer builds and then requires um, checked annually, is what he said, but I, I think that manufacturers in their maintenance manual specify what needs to be done when it does and doesn't the FAA require that then with SLSA? 
Well, the SLSA situation is 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 very peculiar. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, basically, when the LSA rule was 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 approved, the the the, the FAA said, you know, we don't really want to have anything to do with these these airplanes, <laughs> and so they 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 basically put it off on onto the manufacturers. Um, so it's a very different situation legally than, than certificated aircraft or um, experimental aircraft. Uh, that there's a long history of FAA legal decisions that makes it very, very clear that um, manufacturers do not have the authority to tell owners what maintenance needs to be done. Only the FAA has that authority. Um, but for SLSAs, the situation is is different, and it seems very peculiar that SLSAs should have a, a much more rigid rules for maintenance than uh, uh, than 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 what certificated aircraft have. But that's that's the situation. Now, you know, another another question is. It, is any of that enforceable? Be because the whole point of the SLSA rule is that the FAA doesn't want to have anything to do with those airplanes. Mm -hmm. That's the way, that's the reason the rule came out the way it, it did. Um, it, it's it's hard for me to imagine that the FAA is going to very aggressively uh, in, enforce uh, on S SLSA owners that they have to do things the way the manufacturer says. That's what the reg says, but it's hard for me to imagine that the FAs can be very aggressive in, in, in enforcing that because the whole reason that the reg came to be is because the FAA basically wanted to wash its hands of this ca category of aircraft. So, um, you know, I, I, I raised an issue with the FAA legal a few years ago uh, on the question of um, uh, whether the engines had to be overhauled, the, the vast majority of, LS, uh, of SLSAs are powered by Rotax engines. And, and Rotax says that the engines have to be overhauled every 12 years. So 12 years after the, the, the uh, LSA rule came into being, um, a whole slew of these airplanes wound up with 12-year-old engines. And the question was, um, did they really have to overhaul the engines in 12 years? Because if they were certificated aircraft, the, the answer is clearly no. And so uh, I, I researched this a little bit, and it turns out that there, there, there were two um, decisions that came out of the, the, the FA rulemaking division, the division of the FAA's Office of General Counsel, um, addressing that particular question because a couple of different people had written letters to the FAA saying, do I really have to overhaul the engine at 12 years? And there were two separate decisions that came out of FAA legal, um, written by two separate lawyers in, in, in the rulemaking division who came to exactly opposite uh, opinions. One of, the, one of the FAA opinions said, yeah, you do have to overhaul, and the other one said, no, you don't. <laughs> And I pointed this out to, to to the department, and I said, "Hey guys, you know this is a little embarrassing. You've got you, two two of your lawyers are saying totally opposite things. You really ought to, you know, rescind one of those decisions and and make up your mind what the answer is." And they they never did anything about it because they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. You know, they they talked to the maintenance division, and said, "What should we do?" And the maintenance division said. Uh, you know, we don't have a, we don't want to have anything to do with these things, so that they actually never even even resolved that issue. So to this day, there's there's two separate decisions that came out of uh, the rulemaking division that say exactly opposite things about whether you have to overhaul Rotex engines 12 years on the SLSAs. And uh, so I, I, my conclusion is that the FAA probably is not very interested in enforcing any of these these silly regulations that 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 they wrote up. But that's just that's just my best guess. Well, thanks for that very detailed um, answer. Yeah, excessively detailed. 
right? No, that's good. That was that was excellent, especially for our SLSA owners in the audience. Um, so, question here from Brian: If a Part 91 personal aircraft is operated by a CFI as a Part 61 trainer, is that considered commercial operations and the due items? Um, should be complied with. No, uh, the the if 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 the airplane is is being used for for flight instruction and the um, instruction is being provided by whoever it is that owns the aircraft, uh, that does trigger the requirement for hundred hour inspections. But it's but but the airplane is still being operated under under Part 91, and all of the Part 91 maintenance rules still apply. The only thing that's different is that that it requires 100 hour inspections. Okay. And if the and, and if the instruction is being given by anybody other than than the operator of the airplane, you know, for example, uh, you know. An aircraft operated by a flying club, where there's an independent instructor that offers instruction, uh, who who is paid independently as opposed to being paid by the flying club, then that then he, then that doesn't even trigger the requirement for 100-hour inspections. But if the aircraft is being rented by an FBO, then that's a different matter, right? But it, yeah, it, the hundred-hour inspections are required, but it's still non-commercial operation, still Part 91 operation. Gotcha. Yep. Very good. Um, Joseph was just wondering: Do some shops break down their discrepancy list between squawks and then airworthiness items? Uh, yes, and, and all the good ones do that. And uh, and if they don't do that, we ask them to do that. Um, when they write up discrepancies, we specifically ask them to identify those discrepancies that they consider to be airworthiness issues, where an airworthiness issue means if you don't do something about this discrepancy, we are not going to be able to sign off the annual as airworthy. So it, it's very important that the that the shop identify uh, which discrepancies they consider to be airworthiness issues. Um, and if they don't, you should ask them to do that. So a few people are kind of wondering about insurance. Uh, Carrie's question sums it. Uh, what happens if something happens in an accident and something wasn't done at manufacturer's recommended due time? Will the insurance not pay? Oh no, the insurance, of course, will 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 pay uh, independent of that. The insurance policy requires that the aircraft be in an airworthy condition. Most insurance policies require that. It varies a little bit. For example, an Avemco policy only requires that the aircraft be in an airworthy condition um, at at the inception of the policy year. And, and if you have an accident halfway through the policy year and your annual has expired, they still cover you. Not not every insurance company is writes it up that way. But the the insurance company requires that the aircraft be airworthy, and for it to be airworthy, it simply means that it, it's in annual inspection, and the pilot in command is not aware of any um, obviously unairworthy other uh, unairworthy items. You know, the, the basic rule is that once a year you have to hire an IA to 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 perform a, uh, an airworthiness uh, determination on the airplane, and the other 364 days of the year it's the pilot command that makes that determination. Um, but that's the only requirement that insurance has is that the is that the uh, the aircraft uh, be airworthy. Now. Um, the more complicated question would be if there was a civil law, if there's an accident and there was a civil lawsuit, um, and, and you know that's much harder to determine because juries can can do anything that that they want to and that they're they're quite unpredictable. But as far as insurance cover, uh, coverage is concerned, um, if, if 
if the annual signed off as airworthy and the pilot in command was not aware of, of, of any obviously unairworthy issues at the time of the flight, um, that, then the insurance is going to cover. Jarrett says, you said that um, all of Part 91 can defer anything that is quote unquote due. Does that include turbine engine aircraft as well? Uh, it does. Um, yes, it does. Now, now, there are a couple of other considerations. For example, if the engine is within warranty um, and you don't follow the manufacturer's guidance during the warranty period, then then they could potentially deny warranty coverage. Uh, that, that's, that's a different issue. But typically, you know, the warranties, for example, on engines are pretty short in, in at least in the piston GA world. Turbine, I don't know what, the, what warranty period is on turbines, to be honest with you. Jim wonders if you could uh, please remind us of your advice if a shop refuses to sign off as airworthy unless a non-required repair is approved. Well, I'm not exactly sure what that question means. Um, when you say non-required, um, you know, An IA's job is to is to make an airworthiness determination of the aircraft. That that's his job. And the definition of airworthiness, uh, and and I'm right now I'm talking strictly about certificated aircraft because there is no concept of airworthiness for a non-certificated aircraft. Um, but for a certificated aircraft, um, for the aircraft to be airworthy, it has to meet two criteria. Uh, the first criterion is that it has to comply with its type design. And the second criteria is that it has to be in condition for safe operation. Um, the first of those criteria that it um, has to comply with its type design is at least in theory an objective criterion. You, you, you should be able, you normally you, you s res determine whether something complies with its type design by, you know, making measurements and comparing the aircraft with 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 manufacturers drawings and stuff um you know if the if the wing skin is supposed to be 032 uh 2024 t3 out clad aluminum uh it, it it either is or isn't uh or if the brake discs have you know a minimum acceptable thickness of of you know, so many thousands, then, then, then that brake disc is either airworthy or it's not airworthy. The second criteria, which is in condition for safe operation, is a completely subjective criterion. And, and it's the IA's opinion, is, is this airplane safe or not? And different IAs can legitimately disagree because uh, that, that condition for safe operation criterion is is completely subjective. It's it's the IA's opinion as to whether something is safe or not. Um, and interestingly enough, if it's an experimental aircraft, um, there is no type design, which is why we never talk about airworthiness in, for experimental aircraft. Uh, we only talk about um, condition for uh, for safe operation, and that, that's why experimental aircraft don't have annual inspections. They have annual condition inspections because we're not for an experimental aircraft, we're not trying to determine whether the aircraft is airworthy. That's an undefined term for experimentals. We're trying to determine whether it, it whether that aircraft is in condition for safe operation, which is why we call it a condition inspection. But but that condition business is completely subjective. Um, and so a, an IA has the discretion of making that determination of whether something is in condition for safe operation any way he wants to. So some IAs could say, you know, I don't believe it's safe to operate an engine past TBO, so I'm not going to sign off an annual as airworthy if the engine's over TBO. Now, there's no legal basis for that. The FAA doesn't say that engines have to be overhauled at TBO. Um, but 
but a particular IA could say, well, I just, you know, I just won't sign off an, a, an annual is airworthy if the engine's over TBO. So first of all, it's a pretty good idea to have a discussion with your IA about stuff like that. If you have an over TBO engine, you probably should ask the IA before you hire him for to do your annual, hey, I, you know, my engine is 300 hours over TBO. Do you have a problem with that? And if he says yes, then you probably don't want to hire him to do the inspection. But if if you are in the middle of an annual inspection and the IA says, "Well, I, I'm not, I'm not willing to sign off the annual as airworthy unless you do X, Y, and Z," and you consider X, Y, and Z unreasonable, um, then you just say, "Well, look, I don't want to do X, Y, and Z, and you don't want to sign off my annual as airworthy unless I do X, Y, and Z." and We've talked about it. We obviously are not going to have a meeting of the minds on that subject. So go ahead and sign off my annual as unairworthy and give me a discrepancy list for X, Y, and Z. And then I can take my airplane to any other mechanic I want to and say, deal with the X, Y, and Z situation. And hopefully the second mechanic you take it to has his, has his head screwed on right and, and he won't make an issue over X, Y, and Z. That's you know that's that's the way you you handle situations like that. Now, hopefully you've you, you've had a good enough discussion with with your first IA that you're not going to get into a situation like that. But every so often it does happen, and the owners you know get out of jail card in in situations like that is to simply tell the IA to sign off the annual as. as as unairworthy, it's what's called signing it off with discrepancies. It doesn't say unairworthy. What the logbook entry says is I certify that this aircraft has been inspected in accordance with an annual inspection and a list of discrepancies and unairworthy items has been given to the owner. And then he gives you a piece of paper that he signs and dates with a list of things that he found unairworthy and you can go to anybody you want to to, to resolve those issues. So that, that's that's the way you deal with a situation like that. But it doesn't happen very often. Um, once in a while, we run into a situation like that. But you know, we're managing north of a thousand airplanes, and, and I, I bet that doesn't happen twice a year. Justin wonders: Is it true that an AD must to be complied with before a ferry permit for an annual inspection can be authorized? A little background info he gives. I I needed to delay my annual. The shop 50 miles away agreed and recommended a ferry permit, but last minute the shop called, told me all ADs must be completed before the ferry permit could be issued. That that's almost true, actually. Uh, there 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 are a few ADs that explicitly say. That, uh, that ferry permits may be uh, issued to move the airplane to a location where the AD can be complied with. Most ACs don't say that. Um, and the general rule is that, that, that the FISDA will not if, uh, issue a ferry permit unless all ADs are complied with, um, with, with the sole exception of those ADs that explicitly say that it's okay to issue a ferry permit. There aren't very many of those, but they have that happens occasionally, particularly with emergency ADs. Because emergency ADs will come out with like a very, very short compliance time. And the FAA recognizes that some airplanes may be at locations that where, where the AD can't be complied with. Um, so sometimes those ADs will, will explicitly say that ferry permits can be issued, but Except for ADs that explicitly say that, the general rule is that that uh, that the FISDO will not issue a ferry permit unless all ADs are complied with. Bennett wonders if an IA signs off the annual with discrepancies, do you need a ferry permit to fly the airplane to another mechanic? Yep, you certainly do. Certainly do. You always need a ferry permit to fly an airplane that is unairworthy. I think, 
you know, FAR, I think it's 91.7, says that that you're not allowed to fly an airplane unless it's an airworthy condition. The ferry permit is 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 the exception to that. It overrides 91.7. It's it's the FAA's special dispensation to fly an admittedly on an airworthy airplane. Fred asks, where would you draw the line on recommended uh, versus working fine? I have a constant speed prop that was last sent for repairs 15 years ago. The manufacturer recommends five years and my AE says it's time to do it, but it works without a hitch. Do you have any guideline? Well, I mean, you, you need to either negotiate with your IA or you need to find another IA because, I, as I said, the IA has the right to say, hey, I'm not comfortable with that and I'm not going to sign off the annual as airworthy. Uh, if it gives you any 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 warm and fuzzy feelings, my, my props haven't been overhauled for 20 years, so... <laughs> But but then I'm a, I'm my own IA, so I don't have to negotiate with anybody. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the the you know the IA has the discretion of saying I'm not comfortable signing that off, and he doesn't need any any more reason than I'm not comfortable because, as I said, the 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 second criterion of airworthiness is condition for safe operation and that's purely uh the IA's opinion it's that there's no you know there's 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 no hard guidance for what's safe and what isn't every IA is entitled his his individual opinion on that so if he feels that he's just not comfortable signing off the annual with the, with the the prop that hasn't been overhauled for 15 years, that's that's within his discretion to 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 do. Of course you always have the option of saying we'll sign it off with a discrepancy on the propeller. But um uh, but you know but again the, the you should probably have a have a sit down with him and say look you know it's 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 working fine. I don't see any reason to to do it, can, can you know? Can we compromise on this or, or whatever? But do understand that that it is within the IA's discretion to to refuse to sign off an airplane as airworthy if he is not comfortable signing it off as airworthy. Larry asks: Is taking engines past TBO um, with maintenance on condition generally accepted by AAs now? Or is there still a significant contingency against that practice? It, it's it's you know it's all over the map. Um, um, typically, the the old school IAs tend to tend to still be believers in doing things on fixed timetables, and the younger guys are are, are more accepting to uh, doing things on condition. Um, but you really need to interview the IA before you hire him and ask him about stuff like that so you understand what his philosophy is so that you don't wind up, you know, stuck in the middle of an annual having a dispute with the guy. John wonders, can an A&P sign off the discrepancy list? Uh, well, it's not a question of signing off the discrepancy list, but 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 yes, an A and P can can clear any discrepancies that are written up uh, with an annual that's signed off with discrepancies. It does not require an IA. Does not require ever going back to the IA who 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 did the inspection. And in fact, you know, conceivably there are certain discrepancies that wouldn't even require an A and P. For example, if the just you know to to take a silly example, if the if the uh, the annual was signed off, if one of the items on the discrepancy list was that that the tire was excessively worn and the cord was showing, um, well, that's a discrepancy that the owner can can deal with himself because changing tires is is preventive maintenance that owners are allowed to do on their own recognizance. 
So it, it, the discrepancies only need to be cleared by whoever is authorized to, you know, to, to, to deal with them. Um, and it, but it certainly doesn't take an IA. Um, the only time an IA w would be required to do a repair is if it was what was what's called a major repair um, that that requires approved data and all sorts of stuff and a 337 form. And for major repairs, an IA needs to needs to sign it off. Um, but the vast majority of repairs are not major repairs. Great example. Terry uh, wonders, uh, I understand the value of an engine analyzer for fuel injected engines, but what about engines with carburetors like the old Franklin engine I fly behind? It seems to me that an analyzer for these engines would only show cylinder head temps and EGTs. Well, that's all most <laughs> a lot of engine analyzers show. It, it really has absolutely nothing to do with whether the engine has a carburetor or, or not. Um, the 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 uh, an engine monitor um, at at its at its minimum, the simplest engine monitors let us see what's what's going on in the hot section of the engine when the engine is running, which is very important. Um, and more modern analyzers there or engine monitors with with larger numbers of sensors let us see other things you know like the condition of the electrical system and all sorts of other things that almost none of which have anything to do with whether the engine is injected or not um you know i have a philosophy about that that, that says you know if if, if uh, look if if i have a, a cylinder go south on my Cessna 310, which has two six-cylinder engines, um, you know, I fly to my destination and I think about what it's going to cost me to fix the problem. If, if I have a cylinder go out in a in a in a Bonanza that's powered by a, a one six-cylinder engine, I probably land at the at the closest airport and change my underwear. And if I have a cylinder go out in a Cessna 172 that has a four-cylinder Lycoming, I, I very well may wind up in a field or landing on a road because four-cylinder engines don't run very well on three cylinders. Six-cylinder engines run a little bit better on five cylinders. So you, you tell me who needs the engine monitor the most. I, I would say it's the Cessna 172 because it, it has the, the, the greatest vulnerability if something's going wrong with the engine. Robert's wondering, do you have an estimate of what it would mean to the country's GA maintenance capacity if everyone went by condition rather than time? In other words, how much maintenance effort now being done could be declined or deferred? Um, well, I, I don't really have a specific answer to that with regard to general aviation. I do know that when the airlines changed uh, to a, a, a basically on condition system uh, back in the 70s, um, the the amount of of uh, preventive maintenance dropped precipitously. The amount of uh, downtime also dropped precipitously. Uh, it was, um, I do have some figures on that. I don't have them at, at my fingertips right now. I, I have some PowerPoint slides I know that I prepared that talked about what the impact was on things like the 747 and the DC-8 and so on when they changed their maintenance philosophy. Um, and, and it was very, it was absolutely dramatic. It was absolutely dramatic. And, and I I can't quantify it, but I my sense is that, that the same thing would be true of uh, in 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 piston GA, our airplanes for the most part are grossly over maintained um, because they're they, they're typically maintained in accordance with the manufacturer's maintenance manual recommendations, which are generally gross overkill. And um, I think if we could, and, and I've you know I've been working for 20 years trying to very gradually. <laughs> 
takes a lot of patience, but to, to gradually try to influence the industry to move to a more of a reliability centered maintenance approach like what the airlines have been using since the 70s, um, which is based more on, on condition and, and less on fixed timetables. But I, I, yeah, I do believe that it would have a, a dramatic effect. And I think it's important because we're, we're facing a gigantic mechanic shortage. I mean, right now, um, most of the decent shops that we work with are have have their annual inspection calendar booked up for, you know, at least six months in advance. Um, the shops are extremely busy. We, there aren't nearly as many mechanics as we need to maintain these things. Uh, and so, in in a way, I think maybe the mechanic shortage may be one of these things that's going to force shops to do things in a more condition-based way because th they just don't have the resources to to, to maintain uh, everybody's airplane um, it, you know by the book the way the, the way they used to um, and I think I think that's going to be a win-win situation for everybody um, but but it's an industry that's very very um, averse to change it's very hard to to get mechanics to consider new uh, methods th that are different from what they were taught in a &P school uh, to, uh, uh, you know, for example, we, we, we've been on a major campaign to say, look, uh, just because a cylinder has low compression doesn't mean it has to come off. We have all way kinds of ways of, addressing the situations without removing the cylinders and removal of the cylinders should be considered a last resort after other things have been tried and failed. Um, that's not the gen that's not the way uh, mechanics generally treat um, situations like that right now. I mean the vast majority of mechanics if you know if the cylinder doesn't pass a compression check it comes off and that's not the best way to do things. It's not the most efficient way to do things, um, but it's the way they were taught. And, uh, and, and it's hard to get mechanics to, to, to change from the way they were originally taught. So uh, it takes a lot of patience and we've been, we've been working at it, making some progress, but it's not the kind of thing that's gonna change overnight. And all your webinar presentations over these years have all been helpful to help educate us all on on that philosophy and yeah sure we, we, and you know I, I i you know i i mostly address these webinars to aircraft owners because aircraft owners tend to be much more accepting of of change and of doing things in modern ways and aircraft owners can can vote with their credit cards as to <laughs> what shops they take their airplanes to so i you know i think if you know, if we can get an army of aircraft owners uh, on on board with these things, that that's that's going to have a pretty uh, that that's that's the best way that we have of, of of getting mechanics to to come around. I think. So, talking about a credit card, John wonders: as a new owner of a Cessna 182, should I expect a twenty five hundred dollar bill for my 182 annual or what should I expect to pay for an annual on my 182? Well, first of all, we have to define what the word annual means. Um, it, it, normally, the inspection is done on a flat rate basis. Um, $2,500 is probably typical for a Cirrus SR22. I would expect a Cessna 182 would, would be a little less than that, but you know, maybe somewhere between Fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars to do a, a, a thorough annual inspection, um, but that's just the inspection part of the inspection, and that can be done on a on a flat rate. Then, based on the results of the inspection, you you may have some list of repairs that need to be done, and that list is kind of unpredictable until the inspection gets done. So there's no way if 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 by annual He's talking not about the annual inspection, but what I call the annual ordeal, which is 
the inspection followed by the repairs that the inspection um, uh, indicates are necessary, th then that's much more unpredictable. Um, he, he says as a new Cessna 182 owner, I, I would say that as a general rule, the first annual inspection on a new owner's watch is usually a much more expensive than, than the second or third or fourth inspection because very frequently the first inspection uh, is, is a catch-up inspection. Um, and uh, so it's, it's owners who, who, who have bought a, a pre-owned airplane, even if they've had a, you know, a, a good thorough pre-buy done, need to be prepared that the first annual inspection that they pay for is probably going to be more expensive than than, than average. It just seems to work out that way. Few people have wondered this. Uh, Frank asked, do you have an opinion for moving to a biannual inspection? Uh, do I have an opinion on it? Uh, well, uh, first of all, my opinion is that, that, that the FAA would have absolutely no interest <laughs> in talking about that. Um, you know, I do think the the notion of the annual inspection as we know it in in uh, in GA is it's 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 certainly not optimal because there are parts of our aircraft that really ought to be inspected more often than once a year, and there are other parts of our aircraft that really don't need to be inspected as frequently as once a year. And when you're talking about, you know, large aircraft, um, they don't do annual inspections. They have this whole series of phased inspections where certain things get inspected a lot more often and other things get inspected a lot less often. Uh, and the manufacturer can kind of tailor the inspection to, you know, for example, if, if thinking about a piston GA aircraft, everything firewall forward really ought to be inspected a lot because it all, everything in the engine compartment is is operating under very hostile conditions, high heat and so on, and is constantly is trying to, you know, burn itself, melt itself, and vibrate itself apart all the, all the time. Um, and there are other parts of the airframe that like wheels and brakes that ought to be inspected fairly often. And then there's other stuff like, like, you know the primary control systems and 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 empennage and so on that really don't need to be inspected as often as 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 every year but in its infinite wisdom for small airplanes the FAA has said we don't we're not going to have phased inspections we're going to we're going to have annual inspections and even if you try to do a phased inspection by by doing what the FAA calls a progressive inspection a progressive inspection allows you to inspect certain parts of the aircraft at various times during the year and kind of spread the annual out over over a year. Um, and it's often done by airplanes that are that are working airplanes and can't afford to be down very long at any particular time. But they still say, hey, you know, if 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 the end of the year comes and you haven't you haven't gotten through all of the phases of the progressive inspection, you, you're going to have to finish them up because you can't go more than a year without inspecting everything. Um, so the FAA hasn't, doesn't really have any flexibility uh, on the inspection intervals for small airplanes. And it's just, uh, even though it's not optimal, uh, and even though we, we all know that there are some things that ought to be inspected more often, other things don't have to be inspected that often. From a regulatory standpoint, we're kind of stuck with this structure of annual inspection, and I don't expect that the FAA will, could, would consider changing that. Grant asks, you mentioned batteries are generally okay if they are less than, if they aren't less than 80% of new capacity. How do I determine the capacity of my battery? Um, well, you do a, you do a capacity check, and um, the, the two primary manufacturers of, of batteries for 
for GA aircraft, which are Teledyne, Gill, and Concorde, um, each have uh, maintenance instructions for doing capacity checks. They they differ slightly from one another, but but basically the the, the way it's done is a, a battery is is rated at so many ampere hours, and the capacity check consists of of, of, of charging up the battery till it's full and then putting a pretty heavy load on it and measuring the amount of time it takes until a voltage drops below a certain threshold voltage. And, um, and, and that time represents you know, the, the capacity of the battery. And um, if that time is less than about 80% of uh, what a new battery would, how, how long a new battery would last under those same conditions, then the battery is considered to be uh, uh, in need of replacement. Benjamin wonders, how do you decide whether or not to decline a maintenance item without an engine performance data from an in-flight monitoring system? especially on older airplanes and engines? Well, you know, a, a, an engine monitor is, is, is only one of the many tools that we have for uh, determining condition. Um, it's a very useful tool. And as anybody who has listened to, to my preaching for any length any length of time knows that I'm a, I'm a very strong proponent of installing uh, engine monitors um, I, I I really think every every piston powered general aviation airplane should have something like that installed and I, and I think it's one of the few things that you can install an airplane that will pay for itself very very quickly um, but uh, um, it, it is it is only one of the tools that that we have for determining condition. Um, and we've got a long list of things that we use. Um, we use, you know, things like bore scopes, which are another extremely useful tool. Uh, we use a bunch of old fashioned things like oil filter inspection and compression tests and stuff. Um, but the engine monitor is, is, is one of the tools in our toolkit and it's a very useful one. And so I'm, I'm a strong proponent of, of of installing an engine monitor in, in any airplane that doesn't already have one. Thomas is wondering, do you recommend an oil analysis at every annual? I recommend oil analysis at every oil change. <laughs> um, uh, oil analysis is a trend monitoring tool. Um, a single oil analysis doesn't tell us very much. Uh, we, we really need to look at at a series of, of oil analysis results to see whether there's an adverse trend developing. Um, so uh, we, we recommend doing oil analysis at, at, at every oil change, not, not just once a year at, at annual. Of course, I mean, there are some airplanes that only get one oil change a year, but we don't like to see that happen. We generally recommend that oil ought to be changed at no more than, than than four month intervals, even if the airplane isn't flying very much. And we recommend doing oil analysis at every oil change. All right, let's wrap up the questions here with Bill's question. Um, Bill says, assume your annual was due by the end of the month, but the annual is completed mid month with discrepancies. Since the previous year has not run out, can the plane be moved without a ferry permit or is the plane considered unairworthy even though previous years has not expired? Well, it, 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 it can't be moved without a ferry permit and it can't be moved without a ferry permit for, for, for two reasons, either of which would be sufficient. Um, for, for one thing, you can't fly an airplane that is known to be unairworthy and, and the premise of the question is that the that the airplane's been, been been signed off with discrepancies, which means that that a, that not just a pilot, but but a 
but an IA has made the determination this airplane isn't airworthy. So you certainly you certainly can't fly it without a ferry permit. But but the other reason which which applies whether or not the airplane signed off is unairworthy is um is is this is is a kind of a fundamental notion that a lot of people don't seem to understand very well. The act of performing maintenance on an aircraft, any maintenance, I don't care whether it's an oil change or annual inspection or anything, but the act of performing maintenance on an aircraft grounds the aircraft. And it requires a signature to unground the airplane, to, to, to approve it for return to service. Now, whose signature that is depends on what maintenance was done. So if it was an oil change, which is something an owner is allowed to do, then it's the owner's signature in the logbook entry that, that documents the oil change that approves it for return to service. Um, if it's a repair that isn't, isn't covered by preventive maintenance that it takes an A&P to do, then it's the A&P signature in the logbook entry that, that approves the airplane for return to service. And if it's an annual inspection, that requires an IA signature to approve of return to service. But no matter what kind of maintenance it is, the act of maintaining an airplane, the act of performing maintenance, I, I, I say committing maintenance on an aircraft, grounds it. And it requires an authorized signature to unground it. And what signature uh, it requires depends on what kind of maintenance was done. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, looks like we had about 700 people with us tonight, and uh, thank you all for your great questions. Uh, take a moment, Mike, share your closing thoughts with us. Okay, well, um, very quickly, um, if you'd like to be on my email list, we send a, a monthly newsletter and, and uh, periodically send out um, write-ups of interesting uh, maintenance things that have happened that that that, that have some uh, um, that, that were teachable moments and have some some learning value um, the easiest way to get on on the email list is to text the word savvy s-a-v-v-y to the short code three three seven 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 you can do it with you on your on your smartphone and uh, that will trigger a uh, a mail bot that will ask you for your email address and will put you on the list. Um, that only works if you're in North America. Um, you can also sign up by going to the SavvyAviation.com website and clicking on the link that says sign me up. Um, or if you if you stick around for the uh, post webinar survey that Tim's going to put up, there's a check box on there that you can check and that will also get you on the list. So. Any of those three ways will will we'll get you on the list. Um, my uh, four books are available um, at uh, Amazon, Aircraft Spruce, at the EAA bookstore. Um, the, the the manifesto book is available as an audio book, and we're in the process of of uh, of getting an audio version of the engines book that hopefully will be available in a couple of months now. Um, so, and also I, I do a monthly podcast uh, that's produced by AOPA. It's called Ask the A&Ps. I, I, I do it with my, my colleagues, Colleen Sterling and Paul New. And it's basically a call-in show that where, where owners will call in with with maintenance questions try to stump us and we'll do our best to 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 provide answers and try to have a little fun in the process of doing it so um, you can listen to the podcast at any anywhere that that, that you get podcasts uh, um, Apple podcasts or Spotify or and, and any any of the standard podcast places uh, if you'd like to um, participate in the in, in the podcast and, and uh, ask questions. You can mail questions to our producer, Ian Twombly, by sending them to podcasts at aopa.org. And uh, uh, 
assuming that Ian determines that your question is is uh, is worthy, <laughs> airworthy, uh, he'll he'll schedule you to uh, to participate in our next recording session. We usually record the podcast about the middle of each month, and then they do all the editing and sweetening and stuff, and it gets uh, it gets published on the first of the month. Um, Finally, the uh, my my next three uh, first Wednesday of the month webinar is coming up. November, um, I'm going to be doing a, a webinar on on real life breakdown situations where I, I'll go through uh, half a dozen uh, cases of aircraft owners that have that have had breakdowns while they were on a trip away from home and called our hotline and how we help them get back in the air. Uh, as, as as quickly as possible. Uh, in December, I'm going to be doing a presentation on a research project that we're doing, which I think you'll find very interesting, called Project Gadfly, uh, which is a, a generalized anomaly detection um, uh, algorithm that uh, that allows us to uh, analyze engine monitor data, looking for stuff that doesn't look right, <laughs> um, and it, it's really quite interesting. It, it involves neural networks and deep learning and so on, but the, the net result is a, a computer system that can, can look at engine monitor data and identify stuff that, that, that just doesn't seem to, to, be, uh, to be normal. Um, right now, we're going to be using it to just highlight flights. We get about 10,000 new flights uploaded to our, to our platform a week, and of course, we, we can't look at them all, but uh, the, the, the purpose of this project is to have the computer look at them all and to flag the ones that thinks that, that, that it thinks that our human analysts really ought to take a look at because something looked weird about it. And uh, we'd love to see this technology eventually make its way into the cockpit so that our you know the engine monitors actually in the, in the airplane uh, could analyze data in real time and, and notify the pilot when something didn't look right. Um, but anyway, that's, that'll, that'll be an interesting one. And then in January, um, I'm doing a webinar called Systems Awareness. Um, we'll be talking about a couple of, uh, of engine failure accidents that occurred um, in, in which the, uh, uh, the, the, the pilots, in, 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 in one case, the, the, the pilot was pretty oblivious to how the systems were in the airplanes worked. And, made some bad decisions as a result, even though he was a well-qualified CFI and so on, knew, the, knew how to fly the airplane extremely well, but didn't really understand the, the systems very well. And another case of, of a pilot who did, who did a little bit better <laughs> and uh, some lessons learned from, from looking at those, those, those two incidents. So those are the next three webinars uh, that, that, are, that, that I'll be doing on the first Wednesday of each month. And, uh, and that's all I have. All right. Great job, Mike. Uh, thanks uh, very much for the very informative session. And to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you all so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening, everyone. See you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.